In this episode, we will examine one of the first chapters in the book, which looks at the evidence from Alaska that a catastrophe occurred in the not so distant past. Velikovsky's main premise is that there are many sites in Alaska where the permafrost layer contains vast amounts of bones from extinct animals such as mammoths, mastodons, etc. The bones alone account for millions of animals and it would seem that their bodies were torn limb from limb and then mingled with uprooted trees. He dated the event to the end of the last ice age or early post-glacial times. The bodies of these animals are also covered in four distinct layers of volcanic ash. Volcanism cannot account for how these bodies were torn limb from limb given the size of the area, covering the northern unglaciated area of the peninsula. Velikovsky's main sources for this chapter are two papers that appeared in American Antiquity in the 1940s. The first is Frank C. Hibbins' Evidence of Early Man in Alaska. The second is Froelich Rainey's Archaeological Investigations in Central Alaska. In 1896, the discovery of gold in Alaska sparked an influx of prospectors. In order for them to be able to reach the gravel beds containing the gold, they had to remove a dark layer of permafrost filled with bones and carcasses of deceased animals, and they named this material muck. The material is mainly derived from the local schist bedrock, interspersed with a considerable amount of organic matter in the form of vegetation, bones and actual carcasses, ice lenses, peat lenses and volcanic ash. Now this muck covers a considerable portion of central Alaska and can range between 1 to 100 meters in thickness and dates to around the late glacial and early post-glacial age. Now Rainey was very cautious in determining the origin of the material and he stated no adequate explanation of the age of these deposits nor the manner in which they were formed can be given at present. Hibben was much less cautious. The deposits known as muck may be definitively described in the opinion of the writer as loose material. All characteristics seem to indicate a windborne origin from comparatively local sources as the material resembles the underlying bedrock. The outwash plains of the local glaciation are likely points of origin for this material. He goes on to state, Although the formation of the deposits of muck is not clear, there is ample evidence that at least portion of this material were deposited under catastrophic conditions. Mammal remains are for the most part dismembered and disarticulated even though some fragments yet retain in their frozen state portions of ligament, hair, skin and flesh. Twisted and torn trees are piled in splintered masses. At least four considerable layers of volcanic ash may be traced in these deposits, although they are extremely warped and distorted. In his earlier paper, Hibben had already pointed out that the deposits were not created in a single event. The torn and lacerated limbs and trunks of these trees give every indication of violent but not lengthy transportation to their present situation. Intermittently, however, these violent erosional evidences are lenses of peat apparently representing a static ground level at that particular stratum for at least several years. The total of these evidences indicates the alternate and intermittent periods of violent erosions such as would dismember animal remains and splinter trees, interspersed with other periods of comparative quiescence so as to allow the growth of forests and peat bogs in the same area. Hibben identified more than a dozen vertebrae in the muck. Animals at present identified from the Alaskan muck include the mammoth, mastodon, horse, at least three species of bison, two species of musk ox, saber-toothed tiger, lion, camel, gazelle, antelope, an extinct bear, sheep and a number of rodents. Hibben's view of such a catastrophe has largely been ignored by mainstream communities, favouring a slow, uniformitarian view. But in a more recent paper published in Nature, new evidence not only supports Hibben's view of a series of catastrophic events causing this, but also pointing to a repeated cometary event being the cause. This idea fits well into Velikovsky's idea, but more on that later. A short excerpt from this paper states, Large quantities of impact-related microspherules have been found in fine-grained sediments retained within seven out of nine 
radiocarbon-dated, late Pleistocene mammoths and bison skull fragments. The well-preserved fossils were recovered from frozen muck deposits exposed within the Fairbanks and Klondike mining districts of Alaska and the Yukon Territory. In addition, elevated platinum abundances were found in sediment analysed from three out of four fossil skulls. In view of this new evidence, the muck and their well-preserved but highly disrupted and damaged vertebrae and botanical remains are reinterpreted in part as blast deposits that resulted from several episodes of airburst and ground ice impacts within the northern hemisphere during the late Pleistocene time. Such a scenario might be explained by encounters with cometary debris in Earth crossing orbit that was generated by fragments of a large short period comet within the inner solar system. Hibbing first identified the muck as loess, which means windborne deposits of clay and silicate matter. This has been reaffirmed by later studies, although dating of this loess still varies from study to study. Many of the uniformitarians have focused their criticism at Hibben and alleged that he made up the account of the number of carcasses he discovered in the muck. So let's examine some of the recent papers to see if they can shed some light on these allegations. Basaka et al. published a paper on Aeolian sediments. This paper does not mention Hibben or specifically the Alaskan muck, but it does make one interesting reference to the permafrost. Most Alaskan loess is associated with present or past occurrences of ice-rich permafrost. In some instances, thick deposits of loess and rework loess contain specimens of frozen Pleistocene megafauna, including mammoth, bear and bison. Frozen Alaskan loess deposits also contain buried forest beds, consisting of horizons of logs, branches, leaves and other biological material, as well as peat, beaver-chewed wood, and paleosols correlative with a last interglaciation. Troy Pugh published a paper on Quaternary Geology of Alaska. In this paper he directly cites Hibben's 1943 paper in connection to the discovery of vertebrae remains in Alaska. Alaska, like northern Siberia, has long been famous for the abundant remains of extinct Pleistocene mammals found in the frozen deposits along major rivers in the valleys of many minor streams. Most of the remains of land mammals are from the unglaciated part of Alaska. Such distribution is to be expected because animals were mostly absent in the glaciated areas during glacial maximums and the glacial advances tended to destroy or cover early fossil remains. The greatest collection of vertebrae specimens is from the Fairbanks area, where tens of thousands of specimens have been collected during the past 30 years. For example, a typical year 8,008 catalogued specimens weighed about 8 tons were collected by W. Geist and shipped to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. A partial list of mammals from the Fairbanks area were given by Frick, Wilkinson, Murty, Stock, Hibben, Tabor, Skinner and Kyson, Scarland, Pugh, Geist, Pugh and Hopkins and Gerthy. The geological literature in Alaska, dealing with earlier placer mining activities, mentions in passing that bones of extinct animals such as mammoth, mastodon, bison, horse and other were found in many localities in addition to the Fairbanks area. On the subject of Alaskan muck, Pew notes, The loess of Alaska was blown from the vegetation-free floodplains of braided glacial rivers. Consequently, loess is thickest near streams draining glacial areas. At the present time, loess is being deposited most rapidly near the modern outwash streams. Loess has been deposited on ridges as high as 760 meters above sea level, but most have been deposited at altitudes of less than 450 meters. A large part of the loess falling on summits and slopes of hills has been washed into valley bottoms to form thick deposits of bedded, massive silt that is rich in organic debris. The deposits locally are called muck. The bedded character of the valley bottom silt has been used as evidence to support the hypotheses for the marine, lacustrine and residual origin of loess. 
In Wisconian time, additional loess was deposited on the uplands and much loess was retransported to valley bottoms to form a carbonaceous, fetid, perennially frozen deposits locally termed muck. This valley bottom facies of loess of Wisconian age is 3 to 46 meters thick and contains abundant vertebrae and plant fossils, including partial carcasses of vertebrae that were entombed in silt and perennially frozen. The most common vertebrae remain in the muck of Wisconian age in order of their abundance are those of the bison, mammoth and horse. The retransported silt of Wisconian age contains many ice wedges, 0.3 to 3 meters wide and as much as 10 meters long. Pew takes the uniformitarian view that the build-up of these carcasses was gradual and states, most of the mammal remains from the Fairbanks area are from retransported valley bottom silt of Wisconsin age, rich in organic material. Most of the fossils are found in valley bottoms, owing to the gradual downslope movement. Some transportation also occurs downstream axes, and the greatest concentrations are found where small tributaries join large creeks. These great accumulations of bones are thus not animal cemeteries or unnatural concentrations. In this paper, he never discusses the condition of the remains and the fact that they appear to have been torn limb from limb, which is the basis of Hibbins' claim, that it was due to catastrophic conditions. But as the more recent paper mentions earlier, shows that there is evidence of a repeated catastrophic event in this region, it questions Pew's final conclusion. Many have argued that the Alaskan muck is stratified, implying that it must have built up very gradually, not suddenly. When you examine Hibben's work, it becomes obvious that he is referring to only the top layer of this stratification. Neither of these are well stratified, so here we are talking about the Goldstream Formation and the Reddy Bullion Formation, for those familiar with the stratification of this muck. They show clear areas that are, and areas that are not stratified, and this means that parts were indeed laid down by gradual processes but some parts were clearly not, and this is exactly what Hibben had already said. He stated at least portions of this material were deposited under catastrophic conditions. The total of these evidences indicates the alternate and intermittent appearance of violent erosions such as would dismember animal remains and splinter trees, interspersed with other periods of comparative quiescence. Velikovsky believed that the glaciation ended abruptly only three and a half thousand years ago, and this is the cornerstone of the short chronology, and he based some of this evidence on two premises. First, the Euclidean points are remarkably similar to modern Inuit points discovered within the muck, and Euclidean points found in the Alaskan muck can be associated with glacial megafauna. Hibben stated, it has been suggested that even modern Eskimo points are remarkably Yuma-like. This was used by Velikovsky in his book. The problem is that Hibben never states who first suggested that they are similar. All primitive points will resemble each other to some degree, given the material and the nature in which they were crafted. The second point has been contested by Robert Thornton. In his paper, a reported early man site adjacent to southern Alaska's Continental Shelf, a geological solution to an archaeological enigma, he claims that the deposits Hibben identified in Chinitna Bay were much more recent, less than a thousand years old, and claimed that the bones Hibben identified as mammoth bones were of uncertain origin and more likely beluga whale bones, which are far more recent. The problem is that Hibben had only identified human remains, the spear points, at this location and not bones, so there was no Alaskan muck at Chinitta Bay, and therefore there would be no mammoth bones to be found anyway. And Thorson used this to his advantage and erroneously stated the occurrence of modern large animal bones, beluga whales, in the centre of the reported site area brings into serious question Hibben's undocumented identification of the bone fragments of the mammoth. A vast portion of Alaska remained unglaciated during the last ice age, as noted by Hibben. The various extensions and lobes of the continental ice centres of the Pleistocene in Northern America never covered the central sector of Alaska, with the exception of the Brooks Range and the Alaska Range, and certain 
of the volcanic areas of the Aleutian Range, the northern portion of Alaska was ice-free during the period known in the south as the Wisconsin. The whole central Yukon sector, large portions of the Arctic coast, the Seaward Peninsula area, and apparently sporadic bits in the coast near Cook Inlet were not only ice-free but provided essential plants, mammals, surface features as would be favourable for habitation. Contrary to popular belief from all available evidence, climatic conditions in the Yukon Valley in the last portion of the Pleistocene were essentially the same as they are today. Most of the evidence for this statement has been derived from the so-called Alaskan muck. Now the real question is how these large areas of Alaska escaped glaciation when the ice sheets covered Ireland and New York. I also find it hard to understand how lions, camels and other such creatures could have thrived in Alaska under the same conditions as today. So there is a big question as to whether some event caused transportation over a much larger scale or whether the conditions in Alaska were very different at that time. So where does this leave us? Since Hibben and Rainey's expedition, no one has focused their attention on the muck. Instead, they have focused on the loess beneath this. And it is true that Hibben's claim for the connection between the Yuma points and modern Inuits is highly questionable. But his underlying work on the muck and the carcasses still stands. Velikovsky's dating of the events to three and a half thousand years ago is not really supported by the evidence in Alaska. But the idea that it was caused by a series of catastrophic events is. By itself, this evidence is not strong enough to support the notion of a global catastrophe. But luckily, there is plenty more evidence to come. In the next episode, we will turn our attention to Siberia and the Ivory Islands. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.